Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here on another beautiful Tuesday evening. We're going to have a chill session tonight. No big trainings, no craziness. I want to kind of figure you guys out and figure out what you guys would like to see for trainings coming up. What some of the struggles are. And I'm going to share some troubleshooting guides that I made up that make things kind of quick and easy, quicker and easier, I should say. In HVAC, it's never quick or easy. <laughs> All right, we have a few people here. So as you guys know, some of you I've seen before, some I haven't. Um, those of you who don't know, what we do on coffee chat nights is we just kind of hang out in the Zoom call and talk about different things. Sometimes we talk about like hiring processes. Sometimes we talk about resumes or we talk about, you know, soft skills or we do a training. But for tonight, we're going to, do some, an exercise that I do with some of the companies that I train, and we're going to do something called struggles and wins. So basically I'm going to go around and ask people what their struggles and wins have been for this week. And we're going to talk about them and figure out how we can make it not so much of a struggle in the future for you. So hopefully my advice <laughs> will serve you all well. Usually it does, especially if it's technical advice. That's the one thing I am good at. Um, and you, if you guys have any questions, you want to talk, you brought anything with you that you want to talk, talk about that you've been waiting for this for, feel free to bring it up. We're going to be super laid back tonight. So yeah, if you, if there's something that you want to say and you're not sure when to say it, just go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll let you know that now's good. There's a hand raise button. I don't believe in raising hands to speak. We're all human beings, but just feel free to butt in whenever you feel like it is how I like to do it. Um, so let's start off with. Sam. Hey, Sam. Okay. I, I have a qu question. What is comparing HVAC to electric, uh, being an electrician, how does the uh, process for becoming one different? Just okay. Wondering so it, depends, that. it depends on your state as far as like, what do you need to do to become one? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. I live in, I live in uh, New York state. So in New York, it's not super bad. Yes. Um, so both of them are pretty equal in New York. It depends a lot on if you go union or non-union, but for typical non-union, um, what you have to do is you have to get your licensing and that's for electrical and HVAC. And then on top of that, some states, I believe New York is one of them, need a contractor's license or a mechanical license. It's called different things in different states. Um, if New York is one of those, you'll need it for either one, for either electrical or HVAC. And then going forward from there, basically, you just need to get hired and do an apprenticeship. Both electrical and HVAC are the same. So in states like New York and Maine, where I live, it's pretty equal. There's not really more to do for one than the other. You just do it differently. Um, but in some states like Texas, Florida, there's several licenses that come after that for HVAC that you don't need for electrical. So Okay. Are you trying to decide? No, I'm already taking a course. I'm already taking a um. I'm already taking a course that was recommended by because I live on Long Island. I was recommended uh, to, by the lo I the local IBW twenty five. They yep. said uh to go to um NASA BOCES NASA BOCES adult education. They have a pro a program. It's uh, four courses that you take it to get into the, and once you complete all four of them, you take a course and they will, then their career uh, center will help you find work. Yep. That's so that's, so I already started with that was basically, to, I assume that would look good because it takes the cost over like $7,500 to do it. So it'll look, oh, wow. so they'll, yeah, no, they'll know it. I'm taking it serious. Any contractor I applied to know it. No, I'm taking it seriously. So, yeah. And if the union told you that it was a good program, they're heavily vetted. So the union does not promote any program whatsoever unless it's looked into it. It's made sure it's 100 percent legitimate and they won't say that it will help you get a job unless it really will. So in New York State, 
union states like New York are coming away from the unions a little bit because the unions are struggling to find people. So now it doesn't really matter as much if you're in a union like it used to. So now basically the union will authorize or they'll endorse other programs that are non-union programs. And that way everybody gets technicians and it's not just like gatekeeping technicians anymore for the union. So if they told you to go there, I would say that's a, pr a pretty reputable course. And I would definitely do that. I mean, I'm also, yeah, I'm taking that into consideration. Also HVAC. I mean, would it, a program like that work for HVAC because you need to know some sort of electrical work for it? Absolutely. Any that type also works of, like an HVAC contractor? Oh yeah, for sure. So any type of electrical or plumbing or HVAC or ventilation courses that you can get under your belt, all of that's going to help in the HVAC world too. So no matter what you decide, any electrical course will help for HVAC and any electrical course will help for electrical. So you'll be set up pretty well either way. Okay. That's that's a really cool thing. I'm, I'm going to look into that program too, Sam. Thanks for telling me about that because it's I'm going to tell my New York people that. Yeah, it's in Nassau County, County of Nassau Bosey's Adult Education. They have a bunch of different stuff to help that you initially pay for and then they'll help you find work. That is so, awesome. I'm writing that down right now. And you guys, anybody in New York, check that program out. Adult Ed. Okay. It's, it's really... Yeah, if well, if you live in on Long Island, I definitely in Nassau County, which is one of the two yeah. counties east of New, New York City, definitely. But uh, Long Island, yeah, you do. That's, that's awesome. Probably very cool. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's go with Cece. Do you have a any questions going into tonight's session? And B, if you don't, what is a struggle that you had this week professionally? I don't, um, as of right now, I'm like gleaning, taking it all in, um, <laughs> yeah. but just a struggle, um, honestly, again, like I, of course I struggle with making sure, like I got my craft together. I just, like I said before, I just want to do a good job, but I am learning from you, like you just get out and do it. So it's really opening up my eyes that, um, honestly, like, you know, get out there and do it. Like, I'm learning. So like it, you know, like for the most part, like the community that you guys provide is like amazing. So it just, it boosts my confidence, honestly, to like get it done. Like, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I can just like, oh, I can do it. You know? yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Like thank you. you. Like, I'm, that was my struggle. But then I went like last week I missed it. I, um, I think I was out of town. And so I watched one of the um older videos and it was just, it was really encouraging. So I had to you know, pull me a step back to realize like, check your human, you got this. So yeah. Yeah. Like what well, was a struggle, but I, <laughs> and I kind of went back I to you guys you. to kind of pull it up. I really wish that I could tell you that struggle goes away. It gets better. Like you're saying, like you build the confidence and then you like, you go back and you look at your community and you lean on them for support. And then you're like, okay, I can do it, but there's never going to be a time where you never, ever think, oh, like this is too much and I have imposter syndrome because it happens to me every single day, no matter how far I go, no matter how successful I am. All I think about all the time is that like, I'm faking it. You're not faking yeah, it. It just okay. feels like you're faking it because it's so okay. different from what you've ever done. It's like, Yay. oh my God, I'm here. But the fact that that has like watching that with you flip flop from a struggle to a win is pretty freaking awesome. So thank you for sharing that for sure. And yeah, just keep leaning on your, your community. And this goes for all of you guys. Like most people who come into HVAC, most people, especially in the past who have come into HVAC, myself included, and that's why I started doing all of this is we didn't have a community of any kind. And like, I was a female, but even if I wasn't, I noticed, and, and HVA chicks was for women only at one point. And I just realized that everybody needs community in this trade, that like every single person could use someone to reach out a hand sometimes. So that's why we opened up HVHX to women and men, because everybody needs the, the things that we offer. And Skillcat feels the same way. Skillcat's always been, you know, any tech that wants help come here, like we got you. And just trying to noticing what the community has been doing for each and every one of us has been the motivating factor in us doing these every Tuesday night and being consistent and always coming up with new challenges and talking to you guys like this coffee chat is more for me than it'll ever be for you guys because this things like this tell me what I need to keep doing and what I need to change and what I need to add. So 
be honest, be upfront. Like we're your family. We're all a giant trade family. And this is how we make that trade family better. So thank you, Cece, for telling me that I'm doing something right because I'm on the opposite end thinking that I'm always doing it wrong. So I appreciate no, that. Definitely a, a, a thank you because sometimes I'm just like, do I throw in the towel, you know? But then yeah. it's just really, like I said, I go back and look, you know, what this community has provided. And it's just now I'm like telling my other friends, girl, come on here. We got this. <laughs> That's when it comes full circle is when you're like, like, I'll talk to my girlfriends and they'll be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like, then go learn it. <laughs> That's what's up. Awesome. Thanks, Cece. All right, let's go with Sergio. Do you have any questions about HVAC or the trades? And if you don't, then what was a struggle that you had in the last week professionally? I'm, I'm just being nosy here. Um <laughs> So I've, I've seen you on LinkedIn and then I looked into skills cat. Uh, so just a little bit about me. I've been in the industry for 22 years. I've been a tech field supervisor, a service manager, and I'm looking for uh, training resources, not just for myself, but for techs. Um, even though I've been around for a while, I I'm always learning something and I try to always try to learn something at least, you know, I, I try to use to, and I'm going to say something that contradicts what I, what I'm going to say now, but I try to do it at least once a week now. But when I first started as a, as a tech, I read an article um, and I'm sure some of you have heard it uh, uh, regarding training. So the article was all about training and it said, if you, if you study one hour a day on any topic, you will be, become a national expert in five years. Yes. So what, what I recommend to all my technicians and anybody I talk to is, if if you want to become an expert, then pick something and, and not just something random, like pick something that you're working on this week and say you want to you, you want you want to know something of how, to, how does a vacuum pump really work? Take a week on uh, an hour a day for a week and pick there's PDFs from JB. There's, you know, obviously nowadays there's t a ton of stuff online. When yeah. I started, just like, like you, there, there was nothing. Overwhelming amount of stuff, right? <laughs> you know, overwhelming almost. But when you and I started, there was nothing. Right. So you kind of had to rely on books. And the thing is, some people don't bother to even pick up the books or watch the videos. So I always recommend take at least an hour. And then what I do on weekends is before my wife and my daughter wake up, I wake up earlier and I'll spend maybe two hours, get some coffee and spend two hours on something that, I've been wanting to read up more on. I'll give you an example. Um, the uh, psychometrics chart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I thought I knew it pretty well. And then Tony Mormino, you know, he posts a lot of stuff about it. He's great. Um, and then Captive Air has a really excellent video on it, explaining like the science to the engineering level yes. of that. So you can be a parts changer for 10 years or you can be an expert in five and then keep just keep studying, keep going. Right. Cause it, you gotta be a good student because we never, we never stop learning. And this is the one trade that like, it doesn't matter if you think you are done, like you will never tap out. I came to HVAC cause I was a teacher and I thought I can teach anything. Like no matter what it is, I can teach it. And I never wanted to be at that level in my career. So I came to HVAC knowing nothing. And now I'm at this point where I'm like teaching other people, but it's still every day I'm learning I mean, a plethora of things. So. Yeah, you get to a I certain agree. point and then you can either stop there or you can keep going. There, There's right. more, even on, on that same, on a simple on subject thing, that you yeah. think, like, you know, belts. I, I'll go to, a, yeah. if there's a class near me on belts and pulleys, I'll yeah. go to, I've been at 20 of them, right. but I'll, I'll still go to another one because I'll learn something that maybe either I haven't heard before or I forgot. Right. And then, and I always try to, you know, and, uh, just inspire the guys to, to do the same so, so i'll drag good. like hey i'm going are you going it's like no <laughs> i'm busy well if i'm going and i'm not on the field anymore why aren't you going <laughs> so that's you all just um, <laughs> yeah. just gotta bully him a little yeah <laughs> yeah i agree 100 percent. and the fact that you are dragging other people into the knowledge with you for so many years and we still battle this i still see this in my daily life all the time elder techs tend to gatekeep knowledge and it doesn't help the younger generation at all. And that is why we're running out of techs. 
So yeah. if people who have been in the industry as long as you have, and that teach the people who have been in the industry as long as I have, and then the people who, you know, vice versa, and we could just keep going, we'll never run out of HVAC techs. But if every one of us is keeping that knowledge to ourselves and taking it to the grave, so to speak, it's not helping anybody or anything. Yeah. So yep. definitely spread that knowledge, you guys. Definitely be like Sergio and make that a point. And like Sergio said, I like how he said that sometimes he'll even do two hours. You guys, that's not two hours that of work that you're adding to your schedule. That's two hours for yourself you're adding to your schedule. You're yeah. making sure that you are disciplined in giving yourself your own time. And that is invaluable. You can't put a number on that. And you, you're... At, in the long run, you're going to appreciate it. Your family's going to appreciate it because, yeah. you know, I, I did that early on and I continue because I like that, that quote that I read yeah. and, you know, soon for all of, all of you guys on here, soon you're going to surpass your coworkers that aren't doing it, not yeah. only in income, but in knowledge. Yep. And it, it just, it feels so good to be able to walk up to, you know, complicated unit and know exactly what you're doing because you, you worked up to that point, but Absolutely. if you don't, you're always going to stay where, you know, where you were that yeah. I, I had, you know, I interview a lot of people and work with a lot of people that uh, say, you know, I got 10 years of experience and then you work with them on the field and you're like, that's not 10 years. That's one oh. year, 10 times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's not 10 years. 10 times. Perfect. So that, that's all I got. That's very true. Sergio. Thank you for that. And I, you guys, I love that everybody that comes here is, here not only to learn but they're here to learn so they can keep that learning going and going and going and going with so many other people that may seem like a tiny little small thing but when you put it on the scale of your entire lifetime or even that five years that Sergio's talking about think of how many people you've taught think of how much knowledge you've imparted that now stays in the world forever and that's because of you that's a, a pretty huge success no matter where you go in your career if you ask me so that's amazing Oh, I love this conversations that we have, you guys. I'm so glad you guys are all here. Thank you so much for coming, seriously. All right, let's go with Charles. So do you have any questions about HVAC or the trades? And if not, what was a struggle or a win from this past week? I think we lost Charles, guys. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone again. All right, we'll move on to what else do I have? Sorry, I got to open the participant list, you guys. We'll go to Ramiro. Ramiro, what do you have for a struggle or a win this week or any HVAC or trade related questions? I ain't got no, uh, no struggle this week. It's been pretty much all motors, ca capacitors, replacement. Oh, yeah. Spring. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm I'm more here just the same thing as Sergio. I'm just learning. Um, I'm a I have what twenty year plus years awesome. in the in the maintenance industry and in HVAC. I've been poly since the age of eleven. I've been working on a laundry mat, fixing appliances, refrigerators, ACs, gas dryers. I uh, bet back then too, right? Oh, a lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's probably the first one I fixed when I was eleven years old. <laughs> I got to yeah. play with one once. It was um out on some things they replaced it and I just couldn't let it go I had to bring it home and, and check it out <laughs> it was so cool you guys gas dryers are really an awesome thing at an industrial level they have them and they always use them for residential use but at a industrial level like a laundromat like Ramiro's talking about they're really yep. cool machines they got meter you know gas metering and all that it's really cool yep. that's awesome so just like maintenance stuff this week huh that's what I've been running into yeah. too. it's like always yeah, the cap yeah. or it's always the motor <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, for the for the past, I want to say five years plus, I've been doing a lot of research on how to train my guys, and awesome. I get the same thing. I get guys who come in with fifteen plus years experience, and they can't even do some of the stuff that one, yeah. one, my, one of my guys that have been there for a year, you know. Yeah. And it's because they 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 follow what I do. Every if I get stuck on something, I don't sleep. I don't I don't yeah. rest until I figure out why why it happened. You yeah, know? and I think that's what it takes to be in this field fully to really like immerse yourself in this field. And I know it's not healthy and I never, ever recommend being that way, but I am that way. And I can't, you know, 
be a hypocrite either. I'm eat, sleeping and breathing HVAC. And even if it's not my problem, like people call my tech support line with one that just drives me crazy for days <laughs> and keeps me up at night. And then when you finally get it though, that feeling, you guys, there's nothing like it. It's like a high that'll last you a week. <laughs> <It's> awesome. <coughs> I love this, you guys. All right. So I think that is everybody that's here so far. So I want to share something with you guys. So today I had a company take leave of our services um, for a little while due to some, tr some personal troubles they're having. Um, but what I did to kind of give them something to take with them, the technicians at that company, is I went through and I made some troubleshooting guides. So I just kind of wanted to share them. They're not, I didn't make slides or anything for tonight because I do that for all the trainings, but I just wanted to show you guys and I will send this out to any, anybody who wants these, send me an email at jennifer at skillcatapp.com. Um, I'll put it in the chat as well, but I will send these to anybody who wants them and I'm making more. I also have my personal assistant is a really killer writer and she's also an HVAC technician. Her name is Liana and she is making cheat sheets that like get laminated and stuck up in the van or stuck in a binder or whatever. Those of you who own companies or have management positions, these are awesome for your technicians. And those of you who are individual technicians equally as awesome. Like I can't stress enough how helpful it is just having something that has a starting point on it that you can look at and say, okay, this is where I need to start. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Um, actually, I'm going to put, I'm going to put my email in the chat real quick. Oh, thank you, Sam, for posting that. You guys, Sam posted the NASA um, adult ed thing in the chat. If anybody is in Long Island or knows somebody in Long Island, they want to share it with. And I'm just going to put my email in the chat, you guys, so that anybody who wants these can have them. Okay. And I'm going to share my screen and just kind of show you guys what I did here. And I'm always playing with stuff. Um, it doesn't always, usually it's for my own <laughs> self, so it doesn't come out pretty, but I just want to show you guys. And I can't find the screen share. Hold on one second. Um, Elliot, do you have screen share on your end? Yes, sorry about that. Oh, I see it. It's under share. And it says that you disabled it. <laughs> Just put it up. You should be able to do it now. Okay, let's see. Yeah. I was like, where'd it go? <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, 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 uh... I'm going to do my entire screen. I can't find it in all those little words. I swear the older I get, the less I can see. It's a crazy thing. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. All right. So this one I put together is on low voltage shorts. So I tried to, for this session, just grab the stuff that is a hundred percent driving everybody nuts all summer long. <laughs> so I didn't put a lot of gas issues. There are some intermittent gas valve and whatever, but I didn't put a lot of gas issues in for this particular one but anybody that's interested in that I'll just keep sending you the cheat sheets that I make it will when we come into heating season those will all be available as well hey Bart nice to see you um <clears throat> okay so this one's on low voltage shorts so first understanding the HVAC system components familiarize yourself with the layout and the components of the HVAC system including the thermostat air handler condenser control wiring we HVAC techs knows this as walking through the door and saying can you show me where your equipment is? <laughs> but I can do you one better because we tend to be in such a rush all summer long that we do that. And then we know where, you know, hypothetically, we know where the equipment is, but also we forget before we come back for the next maintenance or the next service call. So if we need to pick up filters, for instance, or a nozzle, if it's an oil furnace or whatever, if we need to pick up filters, we're not going to have the filter size. So instead of being able to stop on the way there, use time management well, grab our filters and then head to the site, we're gonna have to go there, check out what size it is, remember how many units they have, 
and hope that the person showing you now isn't forgetting any and that you're not forgetting any. So I cannot stress enough, you guys, that one tiny little thing that many of you probably aren't doing right now. I learned this from a very seasoned technician. This is one of those little tips that always when you get there, the first thing you do if you're there for a maintenance or a service call is you take pictures of each unit and you take a picture of each unit's nameplate. And you save it in a folder, whether it be on your laptop, on your phone, wherever you want it, save it in a folder so that when you come back, you have that address and you can open up that folder and you can see, okay, they have, you know, 10 RTUs on the roof, or I need to get filters for their RTUs or their, well, even residential, we need to get filters for their, you know, two air handlers that they have in this duplex. So I need to open up that and see the model number. And then I'll know, you know, what I need, whatever it might be. Um, and take a picture of the filter sizes to you guys and put that in there. That will help you immensely in many, many situations. I have what we call a filter book and it's not just filters, it's filters, belts, um, like, you know, tags, if they have a different type of contactor than normal or whatever. So that helps a lot. And then review the wiring diagram. We all too often think we know everything that there is to know about wiring and about how a typical HVAC system, say it's a split system is wired. That is not true. We're wrong. <laughs> and we always figure that out the hard way. The first thing you should be doing when you walk up to the system, if you think, if you surmise that it is an electrical failure is looking at the wiring diagram. So we tend to believe that the problem is always in the control wiring because that's what's field wired. That's what we wired or the installing technician wired. That's not always the case. I have seen many, many times like in mouse situations where a mouse gets in there and chews the factory wiring. We may think we know what the factory did, but we like to go by color. Our brains form patterns. And sometimes we will go by color and think this one's blue or gray or brown. This must be common when really it's a live wire and you could get hurt, A, or you could further short the system. It's 24 volts, not gonna hurt you too bad, but you never know what it, you know, what a mouse could chew. So familiarize yourself with not only the field wiring part, which is obviously your common 24 volt, but also with the factory wiring, that's important. <laughs> and then locate your control wiring. Uh, as we know, sometimes there the control wires come into the unit in a weird place, not where it's supposed to come in, or it comes in in the right place and it looks very different because whoever installed it was a cheapo and didn't want to buy the right, you know, two or four wire. <laughs> so always make sure that you're locating the correct, you know, wiring before you start to troubleshoot it. Um, and then inspect the thermostat. I don't actually agree with this. I put this in this position because it is probably what you should do. The thermostat can cause problems, but everybody, homeowners tend to think that it's the thermostat just as often as they think they're low on quote unquote free on, right? So just because the, the customer calls you and says, you know, my thermostat's out, there's something, you know, the problem is in the thermostat. You need to verify that because other things can short that thermostat definitely inspect the thermostat, but it doesn't have to be the first thing you do. Um, so to do that, you begin your inspection at the thermostat, remove the thermostat cover and inspect the wiring connections. That when I say inspect, I mean that you're looking for any loose wires. A lot of people don't correctly know, even technicians that have been around for a long time, don't correctly know how to implant or seat a wire into a thermostat correctly. This happens all the time make sure for yourself, because then you know that it's not a loose wire causing it. All you have to do is a little tug test on each wire. If it's tight, it's tight. If it's not tighten it. And then you're also looking for damaged wires. You know, is there any charring or corrosion or mouse chews? <laughs> is there any spot on the wire where the insulation is broken, causing an arc? So we have a thermostat, which is essentially a, a, contactor in a way where it takes a complete circuit to run the thermostat. If you have an arc between the completion of the of the circuit, you're going to have problems that are intermittent. So it's only going to happen when you put the thermostat cover on, or it's only going to happen when the thermostat kicks in. There's going to be many times where you'll see intermittent failures in thermostats. And those are typically caused if it's not just a bad thermostat altogether, those are typically caused by damaged wires. Um, and then check your air handler or furnace wiring. I always check the indoor unit first, guys. It does not matter. You can check whatever unit you want. 
it, it doesn't matter. You're going to do the exact same thing doing the tug test, checking for burnt, loose, or chewed wires in every spot. You're going to test, you know, check the condenser, the air handler, any spot you see wiring, you're going to check it when it comes to that 24 volt. <clears throat> and then test continuity. Use a multimeter set to continuity or resistance mode to test for continuity between the individual thermostat wires. So you want to test for continuity here. You're going to disconnect the wires at both ends, the thermostat and the component. And then you're going to isolate the circuit. You're going to look for any unexpected continuity or low resistance readings. So if you don't have your resistance, it's not there, or you have a weird number for your continuity, you have a bad circuit. Somewhere in that circuit, something's wrong. Usually it's the wire if you're testing for continuity and do not have it. Um, you're going to trace the wiring path. You guys, I have had this happen to me before, and this is why I always put this here. Um, I actually was chasing in an RTU. A lot of you know what an Aon RTU looks like on the inside of the electrical uh, panel. It's not a fun place to be. It's a very scary place to be. And what I did was thought I was chasing my 24 volt wire for my thermostat. And I was chasing a 24 volt that was factory installed. So I was testing continuity. I was getting continuity. I was ringing out just fine the whole time. The problem was in the wire from the thermostat because I wasn't even actually testing it. I just thought I was. So chase your wires. <laughs> big, big thing. You can isolate your branch circuits if you need to. If you get to that point in your troubleshooting, you can inspect the control components. A lot of the time, a 24 volt short will come from some sort of control because that's on the 24 volt side of the system. And then you just replace or repair faulty components. When it comes to electrical, I don't recommend repairing them. I always replace. It's up to you. And then after that, this is the important part, you guys. So many guys call my tech support line and they say, the unit was acting weird. I replaced the board. First of all, there was no other troubleshooting in between those two sentences. It's, it was acting weird. So I replaced the board. Already a no-no. But on top of that, they don't wait to see if it operates correctly with the new board installed. And so five minutes down the road, an hour down the road, whenever it gets warm in the house again, they're getting a call back that says, you know, still doing the same thing. You fix nothing. And then you're going back there and you're now at five o'clock at night because you didn't want to wait and you're troubleshooting a low voltage short all night long after you already, you know, build the customer for a board. Never a fun thing. Callbacks are not something we want. Document, document your findings. I want to put another step in between here because I should have. And that should be ask for help. If you have gone through these steps and you still can't find that 24 volt short and you guys, it will happen. 24 volt short is called the crazy short for a reason. It makes you crazy. So if you've gone through all of these detailed operations and all these detailed steps and you still have not found it, and I have made sure that I added everything I could think of to this list. <laughs> if you still haven't found it, you ask for help. You can either call uh, somebody who is good at wiring within your company. And I, and I don't even mean a senior tech. I mean, somebody who wiring might be their thing. Um, or you can call my tech support line. Um, obviously, Blue On is a lot of money, but you can use them too. Um, there's plenty of places you can look. And then also there are small snippets on SkillCat that have, you know, it's a, it's enough information to help you troubleshoot, but it's also a small enough information that it doesn't overwhelm you while you're on site. You can look those up. There's going to be very, very soon. There will be a place where you can look that up to help you on site. Um, right now it's just in the total courses. You kind of have to look through, but it will be getting much easier to navigate, um, very soon. So that is the low voltage short one. Anybody have any questions? Awesome. I like it. All right. And then I'm just going to kind of scan over these ones. Don't mind all my manual J's here. <laughs> um, I don't know where I put them. One second, guys. Okay, here they are. This one's on short cycling. <coughs> Sorry, guys, I'm getting over a little cold. Um, okay, so short cycling. Everybody's seen it. The compressor runs for only a little while. It shuts off. It then runs for a little while. It shuts off. There are so many causes for this, and that's what we're going to look at is the causes. But what it causes is something very, very important in especially the Southern states, especially the, the warmer states, and especially in high humidity places. 
And in the summer, we're all high humidity places as opposed to maybe four states like in the Southwest, but we are all very, very humid places. So the thing that short cycling causes that causes the most damage, I would say, obviously it slugs the compressor. It's not good for any component in your HVAC um, system, but it causes humidity. So an air conditioner, and most people don't realize this because we know because we're technicians or we're learning to be technicians that we are not actually providing cooling when we are, you know, fixing an air conditioner, installing an air conditioner. We know that we're removing heat. And that is a big thing when the unit is short cycling. If it's short cycling, it's not running long enough to remove that heat. And when we don't remove the heat or we remove, we drop the temperature too quickly without dehumidifying. So these units, if they run, say, for an hour straight, you have the best possible dehumidification going on there that you can possibly get. If it runs for five minutes and hits set temperature and then shuts off, the humidity is still building, even though the temperature, especially in a tight house, is staying the same. So in leakier houses, you don't have this problem as often or it doesn't become as noticeable. But when it comes to newer homes or new construction, we end up with very tight homes and the temperature will drop much faster than the humidity. So if we arrive at a system, whether it's for maintenance or a service call, and we're noticing that it's short cycling, we've got to do everything that we can to possibly stop that from happening. Not only are they going to wear out their compressor and other components too, contactors and capacitors go far more often when we're getting that short cycle going on because they're not built to do that. Um, but here are some reasons. <laughs> So an oversized system, this is my favorite reason. It always goes first for me because I am a consultant and an engineer. And what I do a lot of with a lot of my professional time is I size equipment. I size equipment for, I think it's 12 now, um, other HVAC companies all throughout the US. And that's one of the jobs that I hold. For the most part, this is the number one reason that I see personally is an oversized system. Almost every system that was installed, you know, pre five, 10 years ago is oversized. And that's because manual J did not reach popularity, even though it was built by ACA in the 1980s, it didn't hit popularity in the residential sector for many, many, many years. And only in about the last five years have we seen an uptick. And even now, as of this year, we have seen many cities um, in different states requiring a manual J to be done in order to get a permit to install the system. And that's because we're trying to prevent oversized systems. So if you go into a house that was built three years ago, you may find a properly sized system. Otherwise you won't. You'll see a, a horrendously, disgustingly oversized system, undersized or oversized ductwork. And you will see a bunch of flex if you're in the South. Um, here in the North, we don't really use flex. We use it as it's patented, which is five feet to the register and no more. Um, but in the South, they use it for ductwork. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, other than you have to really make sure that you're not getting any restrictions and that you're sizing it correctly, because if not, you'll have that short cycling going on in your system. So a thermostat malfunction can obviously cause it, you guys. This is when the thermostat thinks that you're at set point when you're not, or if you have it set too close to set point and it doesn't have a big enough load to run long enough. I always say, if you keep it at 74, you might be a little hot, but you won't be sticky. This is my, my motto. <laughs> you might be a little hot, but you won't be sticky. Um, most people don't keep it at 74 in the summer because 74 in the winter and 74 in the summer are two very different things. Um, but try to keep it as far from set point. Try to keep it as far from ambient as you possibly can without freezing it out or making your windows sweat. Um, and then Thermostat malfunctions, really, you guys, they don't happen often. They happen a lot if we see a Nest thermostat, which is installed um, without a common wire. So what happens in this situation is that the Nest is not powering itself and it has a built-in battery. So they will think that it's powering itself, but really it's only being powered on, um, on RC, R or RH or RC. And that means that when the unit is running, it's feeding power to the thermostat. When the unit is not running, it is not feeding power to the thermostat. So what happens is the nest then dies and you have to pull it off the wall and charge it. And for that whole time, your system is off. That is the, probably the biggest one that I see where a thermostat malfunction caused short cycling. It was either 
flickering because the battery is getting ready to die or because the wire wasn't fully on RC or because it didn't have a common at all. Um, refrigerant issues. This can cause it. It is very prominent. Low, low refrigerant levels due to leaks or improper charge can lead to short cycling as the system struggles to maintain the desired temperature. So when you have a low refrigerant charge, your compressor is working really, really hard. And sometimes it just can't keep up and you end up just running for a little bit and then taking a break and running for a little bit and taking a break. This happens a lot. That doesn't necessarily mean that we need to be checking our charge at every maintenance. That just means that we need to be looking for signs that the, the charge is low. Dirty air filters. This is a big one, you guys. Any, and, and this goes for the next couple, uh, any dirtiness should not be there. And for the longest time, people just said, oh, it's run like that all year. It's fine. That is not true. It's not fine. It's slugging the compressor. It is possibly causing leaks from corrosion. Never, ever, if you guys show up, even at a service call, say you're there to fix something. And the problem isn't necessarily the dirty coil that's wearing a fur coat, but you notice the dirty coil wearing a fur coat. Either take care of it right then and there with the customer's permission or ask the customer to schedule a return visit because they are not supposed to run like that. Dirty filters need to be changed as often as humanly possible. Dirty condenser coils need to be washed as often as humanly possible. And dirty evaporator coils absolutely need to be watched and taken care of because evaporator coils, what happens is the nastiness on it tends to then get condensation within it. And it turns to a concrete like substance that is very hard to get off. And that will stop your AC right in its tracks. Faulty capacitors. We were just talking about this with Ramiro. A lot of the time it's a bad capacitor, you guys. So what happens is you need the correct amount of airflow in order to not short cycle. If you're not getting the correct amount of airflow because your fan, even though it's running, is not running correctly. It's not running at the designed load. You're ending up with overamping, or you're you're ending up with not enough capacitance to run the fans correctly. They'll slow down, or they'll run backwards. Lots of things happen from this problem. Um, and then compressor issues. Obviously, this is really um, worst case scenario. So compressors can go weak before they go dead. More of what we see is that copper plating that causes um, acidity within the compressor and that just stops it right in its tracks. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it doesn't automatically short to ground when the windings are screwed. It just keeps running. And that is when we run into this problem. Thermal overload protection, another problem. That's when we have something raising the head pressure, whether it be dirty or it be low charge or it be many things. Something is causing the the the. the the compressor to protect itself and go into thermal overload lockout. We call it thermal lockout. <laughs> so when high temperatures within the compressor or other components trigger the thermal lock, thermal overload protection, causing the system to shut down temporarily and short cycle, this will happen, but it could also shut it down for a very, very long time. And the house is going to get a super load on it, which you also don't want. And then we've already gone over charge and then the evaporator coil Sensor malfunctions happen all the time. We end up with bad outdoor ambient sensors where it's telling us or telling the thermostat that the temperature is wrong and it just continues to kick on and kick off and kick on and kick off. That happens a lot. Make sure that you're testing those sensors, you guys. If you have something happening that doesn't seem quite right to you, check your, um, your, your pressure sensors. Always check high pressure and lower pressure sensors. And if it's on like a furnace or something like that, check your flame sensor. Sensors are a problem. And then electrical problems, we talked about loose wiring. Um, lots of things like that can cause it as well. So that one's on the uh, short cycling issue. Has anybody here seen any, any of these reasons in real life out in the field? You, you guys have never seen a compressor short yeah. cycle? <laughs> yes, I have. I actually yeah. walked up to one with it where they overcharge it. Oh, so overcharging. Yes. You know what? Yep. I didn't I didn't go over that when I skipped by it and I should have. You're right. So when it overcharge when it's overcharged, you guys, it does the exact same thing because then it's got too much liquid on one side. Um, does the same thing. Yeah, and overcharging is actually really easy to do. We tend to make fun of each other when it happens, but it really is easy. If you have, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a, a bad TXV mimic undercharge and so people think that it's 
undercharged. They add refrigerant the whole time. The TXV is doing that like Leonardo DiCaprio smug laughing face at them <laughs> because the whole time it was a restriction. Um, okay, so there's that one. And then I'm going to... Try to go into, where is my folder? Here it is. Intermittent failures, I'm just going to skip around a little bit because there's some gas in this one and we're talking about AC. So thermostat issues, we already talked about. Electrical problems. So intermittent issues, let me just cover that really quick. Intermittent issues, what I mean by that is something that happens and then it doesn't happen. And then it happens and then it doesn't happen. I have a, um, one of my students is struggling with this right now. She has a system that, while she's there, everything is beautiful. I mean, she's got 40 degree vapor saturation. She's got 92 degree liquid saturation. She's got a 10 degree superheat, a nine degree or 14 degree subcool. She's got everything looking beautifully. But when she leaves a few hours later, the suction line ices up and they've got to shut it down. So we've gone over everything with this. We thought it was the fans. We thought it was dirty filter. We thought it was, um, the wrong filter. We thought so many, so many things. We still do not know what it is. I'm troubleshooting it. She's in South Carolina and I'm in Maine. So that's, you know, a struggle, but I'm hoping that she gets to the bottom of it soon because <laughs> this happens all the time. Intermittent failure. Gas valves are known for it. You guys who work on boilers and furnaces know exactly what I mean. RTUs as well. Um, gas valves are known for it. And usually if you give them a little smack smack with your adjustable hammer, quote unquote, you'll get it to come out of it, but not always. And sometimes it can really cause something that you're chasing down for long periods of time. So we want to go over this just a little bit to make sure that that's not dragging you guys, you know, onto a roof at 9 PM ever dirty filters. We've talked about dirty filters. You guys is such an easy thing that you can do. It can be the first thing you do when you get there, regardless of what the problem is. And if that's the first thing you do, then the whole time you're there, you know that that is not the problem. <clears throat> Always replace with one that is the correct MERV rating so that you're not adding restriction to this uh, static pressure. Um, and then low refrigerant levels and refrigerant leaks. Obviously, this is going to cause intermittent problems. Sometimes you'll have enough, um, you know, especially if it's not like you're, we're not talking about like dead flat. But if you have just a small undercharge, you're going to end up with sometimes there is enough you know, liquid in the condenser and enough uh, vapor in the evaporator where it runs fine. And then two minutes later, it just doesn't anymore. The metering device meters it too much or just enough or, or just a little. And we end up with a system shutting off that will then start back up after thermal overload and run for two days. It's crazy. Faulty capacitors. This is the big kahuna, you guys. When a capacitor is failing, it doesn't always fail outright. When a capacitor is failing, it will weaken its ability to run the fans correctly. It will still run the fan. And I get so many calls to tech support that are saying, my fans are running. It's not that. And I'm like, I don't care if your fans are running. <laughs> I want to know how they're running. And the only way to do that is to test. If you're not testing, you're guessing. So over, always be checking, you know, de-energizing and then testing your capacitors. But on top of that, if your capacitor is fine, it still could be a fan issue. We still have fan windings that go bad sometimes. We still have overamping. We have lots of things, you know, that can can go from the capacitor that still make our jobs hell. Dirty or blocked anything, you guys. Dirty or blocked anything. Drain lines should be 100% clear. There shouldn't be. Those of you in the South will we'll talk about, um, you know, drain line boogers. You get the big clog that is like the whole width and length of the tube. And you've got to blow it out with nitrogen. And you get this like snake looking thing that comes out of it that is detrimental to your HVAC system it might seem like a small thing but drains are just as important as any other component um faulty pressure switches we talked about and then sensor malfunctions ignition problems this is where we talk about gas but I I wanted to just touch on this one a little bit control board issues so I just want to give you guys one little tip that will go super far in your lifetime as an HVAC tech if it's one thing that the system is doing that's not correct in the sequence of operations, it's not your board. If there's more than one thing, it could be the board. So just because your system is intermittently lighting and um, let's say it doesn't have proper airflow, that doesn't mean you have a bad board. 
a lot of people think that, that if it's a couple of things, well, that automatically means bad board. It doesn't. You need to test every single component and make sure it's the board. But what a lot of people think is that one weird thing and, you know, say it's skipping airflow and going back to gas or ignition. It's doing that because it's not getting its correct airflow, not because the board is messed up and telling it to do funky things. So we always need to verify, verify, verify. But control board issues, my rule of thumb and the only rule of thumb that I will ever have for control boards, if it is, if it's one thing, it is definitely not your board. If it's multiple things, then it could be your board. And that is the best I will give when it comes to boards. <laughs> External factors. This is one that I really wanted to touch on a little bit. Power surges. A lot of states all just had massive power outages. I was one of them. I had a storm in April that completely devastated my area of Maine. We got 26 inches of snow over four days or over two days, and then another 22 inches of snow over another two days. So over 50 inches of snow in, in four days. So this knocked out power everywhere for months. Brendan is in here too. He dealt with the same thing. He lives in Maine as well. Um, and then on my, my shop, we lost the entire internet wire, which is still currently dangling in the middle of the street. So um, external factors are huge. When we have power surges, many, especially older systems, older equipment do not come equipped with, you know, GFI plugs. They're not, nobody thought about protecting them from power surges to begin with. And so now we are, now we do that a lot, but if you see an older than few year system, you guys, and it's completely like crazy stuff is happening with it, check and see if there's been a power surge. And also the other thing for external factors is bugs, bees, and mice <laughs> for, for starters, but other critters too. Bugs, uh, bugs, bees, birds, and mice are the ones that get me every time I had a complete bird in a flu pipe a couple of weeks ago. It was really devastating for me. Um, but yeah, check your flu pipes, check your electrical uh, compartments and check your coils. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing here like that, I guess is how I do it. Okay. So yeah. So anybody who wants those can e send me an email and I'll send them to you. And then I'm going to be making more. These are not necessarily great for studying and memorizing what they're good for is looking back on them when you're in the situation so you know maybe you're troubleshooting a low voltage short for you know three hours and then the light bulb goes off in your head and you're like oh my god i have troubleshooting guides for this just go back over it and check them off make sure you've done all of those things because a lot of the time i'll do that and then i'll look at the paper and i'll be like oh my god that's what i missed so definitely hold on to those um, Bart says, Hey, Jen, I have some good information about what troubleshooting low voltage shorts I can share. That would be great. Bart, if you want to send them, I can put them in training plans for HVHX. <laughs> um, Hey, Ronald, nice to see you. Um, Ronald, do you want to share a struggle and a win, a struggle and, or a win that you had professionally in the last week? We went around the room, but you weren't here yet. I just lose Ronald again. I'm sorry. I forgot. Oh, there he is. I got you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, we were sitting there having family time and it just totally slipped my mind. I cut my phone off. No worries at all. Okay. Family time was is you, the most important thing you can do. Was you just... Uh, yeah, I was calling on you. <laughs> so I went around the room and I just had everybody share like one struggle and or a win um, from their from work the last week or so. Um, so I just didn't know if you had one cause you weren't here when I asked. Okay. Um, so yeah, we had some thermostat wire mm. that we had to, uh, so this is the first time I've seen this. It was a basement. Um, so it's the ceiling of his basement, but it's, it's technically the floor of his house. Yep. So the floor of his house should have floor joists um two by eight floor joists or two by tens 16 inch on center 24 inch on center with cross beams that's that's, that's the normal structure of a home right however his so-called floor joist slash roof was like many roof rafters in the basement oh my God. So imagine, imagine the crippled and the beams like a roof rafter um or hip joist or something like that but small, 
Yeah, like a little swing joist. Right. Oh man. And we had to we had to cut a hole. Um. Oh, it was just crazy. It it took forever <laughs> just to get a two wire thermostat in there. I'm on my phone. I'm normally on my laptop, but oh, that's okay. It looks uh, fine. I didn't even notice any difference. <laughs> that's great. Thank you for coming. How, how I know you're you all been on. What? How long have you all been on? Oh, just since eight. Oh, so you all about the end? Okay. Yep. Yep, we're all Sorry about that. no biggie. We're Sorry here every that. Tuesday. So you guys also like I'm always preaching to you guys about like work life balance. Do that. If you have a chance to like be with your family, go do that. That's what we want you to do. If you are struggling, I have weeks, you guys, and Cece's talked about it too. We've had a lot of people talk about this. We have weeks where it's all too much and we're ready to quit and we just can't get out of our own way. And something has to get better. Something has to feel better if we're going to show back up to work Monday. And it gets that severe sometimes, you guys. This is what this is for. This is so that you can come here. You can learn a little bit of something that you then have like renewed hope to go out and try it all out with. Or at the very least, you have people who understand because they're doing it every single day like you are. And we're all just here to support each other. That's all this is for. But yeah, if you have time for family time, go do it. I know I am avoiding family time because my one-year-old baby has been so fussy today. <laughs> I'm like, you go, I'm going to go here. We're good. <laughs> but yeah, definitely you guys get that family time where you can, especially because we're about to go crazy for the summer. It is Maine and it's already 85 here, which is insane. We just had, you know, 50 inches of snow last month. So I can't even imagine how it is in the South right now. All right. right does anybody right. have any questions? at all about anything i got a quick one yeah um how do you back to boards uh, mm -hmm. and troubleshooting boards how do you feel when when i get a call from from a technician and and you know it, hey i think it's the board yeah uh, and it usually isn't the board but anytime that we're fortunate enough to have a similar unit next to it i ask them to swap it i don't ask them to take the good board on leave the good board off but take the sus suspected bad board and put it on that good unit yep as long as nothing is shorting out on the bad unit if it's right. just acting weird put it on the other unit and see see what it does and then call me back how do you feel about Very that good idea that's a great idea i wish in a perfect world we all had access to that all the time um that would be great typically instead I end up because I own a tech support line and I get calls from everywhere. So it's not just my technicians that are out in the field. Um, I'm out in the field with them usually. So I can, you know, hands-on help them. But for the people who call the tech support line, I don't have that option. And most of them are honestly hiding from their boss. And that's why they're calling me because they're like, I am not calling my boss for anything right now. <laughs> I'm not getting chewed out. He threw me to the wolves and I'm going to, I'm going to master it. So typically what we end up having to do is literally wire by wire we have to go do you have voltage in do you have voltage out do you what does that look like from your capacitor what do you have from your contactor what do you have then what is it doing what's what part in the sequence of operations are we skipping or what is it doing that's making you think it's the board but i will tell you this that when my tech when any technician calls me and says i think it's the board i say you're gonna have to sell me on that because i don't believe you <laughs> so that is the thing and you guys if you have been on a unit for an hour, for a couple of hours, and you think it's the board, tell yourself you're wrong. Because worst case scenario, you're right in that situation, right? So you want to make sure that you tell yourself you're wrong until the very, very end. I have tested this. I have numbers for this. I know for a fact that I am 100% right because I told myself I was wrong for an hour. And now I know for a fact that I was right to begin with. And that kind of accomplishment is way better than if you just tell yourself it's the board walking up to it and then you walk away, you put a new board in. Even if you're right, you're not going to get that sense of accomplishment because you didn't do the work, right? Do the work. Biggest thing I can say to you. And again, the biggest thing, the biggest one that I should have put on that paper, and I probably will go back and put it on, is ask for help. Because like Sergio saying, his guys will call him up and say, I think it's the board. And then Sergio can say, Well, you can find out. <laughs> Put yeah. it on another unit. You can find out. So if we ask for help instead of killing ourselves, sitting on Google for 45 minutes, driving ourselves insane, 
you know, people who don't smoke are out here needing a cigarette. Like we need to get more efficient at that. And the only way we can get more efficient is to ask for help. And that goes with anything in your life. Really. I'm always preaching that to you guys, but especially if you think it's the board, ask for help. Okay. All right. Anybody have any other questions? One more quick question, Ms. Jennifer. Right. ABC's refrigeration. You said it yeah. last week. What yep. does that mean? Airflow before charge. Airflow before Airflow charge. Airflow okay. before charge. You guys never, ever, ever let me find out you were gauging up to a system before you check the airflow because you're you're ruining it for yourself. You right. got to do non-invasive system check. And this is what our next training is going to be about is a complete guide to non-invasive system check. I'm going to host that one. We're going to go through exactly the steps that you should be doing long before you touch your gauges to that unit. So hopefully that will help a little bit. But yeah, ABC is airflow before charge always. Okay. And that's more for like service techs, right? Um, Yes, but for installers as well. So sometimes when you go to startup or, you know, your startup tech guy went and it didn't work right. And now you're back there to figure out what you effed up, so to speak. Sometimes right. it can be a damaged coil. So you're not getting airflow across the coil, which is where they're not able to dial in the charge. Um, still, I would still say airflow before charge. Yes. I would say in any situation, whether it's installation or service for sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey. Rich says, thank you. Say it louder for the people in the back. Yeah. ABC. So Rich is a, another podcaster, you guys, CC's husband. Um, and he has a show on, I believe it's Wednesday nights now. I could be wrong. Hopefully Cece will say in the chat, but he has commercial kitchen chronicles. Any of you, if you're commercial kitchen techs or you want to learn about this, about the hot side and cold side meeting together in the kitchen, that kind of stuff, check out Rich's show. Um, he's on with Pat Finley and sometimes Jason Latimer. So it's Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. And then my show, you guys, is Saturday nights at 9 p.m. live on YouTube. It's called Misfits of HVAC. I host with Ryan uh, Hughes, Hughes Man HVAC, HVAC and we have, industry greats on every single week. We always have a guest. It's amazing. It's super fun. That's where, that's where we get funny and not so training oriented. <laughs> if you guys want to come hang out with us. All right. I am going to go ahead and sign off you guys next week. We have measure quick again. It's going to be Brian Feeney of measure quick. And it's going to be more of like the business side of stuff and kind of keeping yourself organized in a busy, fast paced cooling season. So make sure you come for that. I'll be there hosting. And then you guys, every Tuesday from now till forever, we have this going on. Oh, we also have the HVA Chicks um, live training series going on right now that I am hosting. So they're going to put it in your community tabs. It will come up as like HVA Chicks live training in that community tab instead of like a coffee chat or a webinar. It'll come up um, this Thursday. We have one with Eric Kaiser from True Tech, True Tech Tools. He's going to teach us some stuff about heat pumps. Um, but you guys are all more than welcome to come. That's 1 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. If you guys have my Facebook, it's plastered all over it, but Emmy will also have it in the app hopefully tomorrow. So keep an eye on that. You guys will get our weekly trainings for that too. So we'll have two a week until sometime in July. So I look forward to seeing you guys all there. Thank you guys for coming and hanging out with me. Thank today. you. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.